Well, let's start with a prayer. In the Father, and in the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we entrust to you this timeless conversation. Give us a deeper understanding and devotion to the Holy Eucharist. Help us to understand more truly what He did and how God for us. And who is present in the tabernacle on our altars. We offer this to you this hands of our Blessed Mother as we say, Hail Mary. Oh, the grace of the Lord is with thee. Blessed is our God among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and the hour of our death. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we didn't get very far last time. Hold the records. That's okay. Um, we're looking at the two presents. Looking at the two presents. Uh, we looked at briefly, we looked at the uh, history of faith, your PD. Now we're on the section, is body of a given sacrifice, sort of point. Throughout the Old Testament, the book of sacrificed animals can be seen in nearly every page. The moment of the, of the fall, God clothed Adam and Eve with skins of animals. The thousands of lambs sacrificed have played here at Passover. Many animals died since this constant reminder or sin. As well as the death of the result of their own. The difficulty with these sacrifices was that not change from why they were offered. When affected, the physical sacrifice of animals and their hearts stayed rooted in the sin. So let's start with this concept of what the sacrifice is and is not. Unfortunately, of course, there's any limited. Our understanding of the sacrifice has been is different than what would have been done years ago. We hear the word sacrifice, now we think of fasting on Fridays. Or we think of you stub your toe, you don't whine about it. That's not what this word really means. And unfortunately, I think we try to understand it backwards. I think we go from going from I uh, gave up meat on Fridays to sacrifice. If I can understand them, then the sheep and the goats. It's backwards. The sheep and the goats, that's the most sacrifice. The offering up through pain or your fasting, whatever it might be, that is the analogous sacrifice. That's what the sacrifice in analogous sense. So understand the sacrifice, we have to go, go back to the Old Testament and look at that's um, what it. What are you laughing at? That's good to me. Sacrifice is a human act of adoration. And a very particular act of adoration. And it has its roots going back to the very beginning of Adam and Eve and God. It takes place, these roots take place in two different aspects, just for a single sheet. It takes place, first of all, in the fact that man is physical. It's three things I say. Man is called the friendship and union of God.
So three things to kind of root into this here. Metaphysical creatures. We are unique in the created universe because we are both physical, material, and also spiritual. We have a spiritual side, we have a soul. So we can know God, we can love God, we can friend God. We're also called to a friendship with God, we're persons, we're made for the for heaven, we're called to be united with God forever. Let's pause there a minute and this is our first little point on this half sheet. The friendship between God and man is different from friendship than we have. Friendship is most basic. It's usually two people or two persons who care about the other, want the other's good. Mutual thing. Well, one side, or you have my dad, I'm carrying the darn about you. That's not friendship. It's a mutual thing. It's easy to see who God desires are. Right? He made us, He saves us, He keeps the distance, He blesses us continually. It's easy to see how God desires our world. But what can we do God? What can we wish for God? You can. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it's not the same thing as giving a human being. But the human being can give them something, help them out. They want them to really work for their good. Because they don't, they don't have everything they need other things. God needs nothing. We can't give him good things. We can't want him to have more is infinite. You want God to have something that he doesn't have, and only know who he is. You think, oh, our Lord needs to be fed by him. The Lord needs him to be, you know, comforted. We do not think of him as God. What we do, can do is rejoice in what we is. Rejoice because it's recognized as good, as right, as in the perfection, and rejoice in it. And that is the center of the heart of adoration. It's rejoicing who he is, recognizing who God is, looking at who God is, and being glad. And praising and thanking God for who he is. And that's something for with God. It's also is the root of adoration. Absolutely. Man was made by God to work with him in a physical way. It is a bridge between heaven and earth. Because we have one foot in the physical world, one foot in the spiritual world. We are the lowest of the spiritual creatures, of God, angels, and men. We are the lowest of those three groups. We are the highest very material thing. Because we are perfect as we have with God. And part of our location as human beings, being body and soul, is that we are called by God to elevate and bring the physical around us Back to heaven and to make it sanctified, glorified, to make it great. You see this in the book of Genesis when God says to Adam, Your work is to till the garden and care for it. Does God need Adam to care for the garden? No. God decided Adam himself to care for the garden. But God chooses this and wants to sanctify all of it. God, in a very sense, the real sense, has left the world finished. Not because he's weak or lazy or bored and not to do it, because he wants us as his children to help him complete. Because by your choices, what you make the world be a better place, and yourself, by your choice to be good people, is going to heaven. And so we have this, this vocation to work with God, be a bridge, to bring the world around us to God, to offer to him. By our nature, we are the priests. Of creation, we're right? taking the world out, elevating it, bringing it to God. This is the first part here. With sin, with sin, a new element was in, and now it's the O oh God of death. That is sin causing death and suffering. You have no love anyway, which is God, but now it's additional debt because of sin. So a sacrifice in a real sense is take is, is finding a way to offer God in a human manner this act of adoration of love. By doing so elevating both the world around us and giving God an honor and glory that's his due. So sacrifice contains several, several things. It's first of all a physical thing. 
It's always going to be a physical gift. A real sacrifice, true sacrifice. It's going to represent the one giving. Can't be totally alienated from the different from him, or it's not going to be meaning. It's offered to God by a priest, and the act of offering is distorted or changed in some way. Each of the others is important. It's physical because it is offered by a human being. We're trying to give God ourselves. We're trying to give God something of us. And so what we're doing is we're offering God something that stands for us, means, signifies our hearts, our lives, who we are. Has to signify our love, show our love for God in the elect, the human right. And we love people, we don't just simply think of thoughts, we don't simply think of nice things at it. We do things. We have this talk about act in certain ways, treat them nice. Don't just simply think nice thoughts in that direction. That's not a human way of showing love. Love is love is a human thing, it's the body and soul. And so for God, as human beings, we show love in a human way, and so that includes the physical thing. A priest, uh, the one offered it to make it a solemn gift, to make it an act of adoration, an act of liturgy, to make it not simply be a personal present. But a solemn and poor act. It's not offered by a priest. It's not a sacrifice. What the priest is not. Has to be with his man of adoration. It's destroyed or changed in some way. First of all, as a reminder that that has come from the world. But also as a reminder that God is the source of life. That God is owed our life. That God is the one who creates us. And therefore, God has owed everything to me in my life. Beyond my life, there's nothing more I can do. Now, God alone has to make it very clear that not what human sacrifices. Who remembers this? Isaac. Isaac. In your life. My word. Abraham's willing to offer the sacrifice. Now, there's no offer for the sheep instead. Now, the sheep, the, 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 Go that means to carry a sacrifice. It simply symbolizes and represents. But Christ comes to be more than, than simply to carry a sacrifice. He comes to uh, join in that offering as part of the masses. We'll look at it more closely later. Um, so this, this sacrifice is something real, something physical. And it's a chance. It's often it's killed. And first of all, there's human beings. It wasn't killed. Being human beings, often what we would do is we would say, okay, I give it to God. But God can't do it, so I'm using it instead. Be a thing, off. And so, but by the death of the sheep, not only are you shown in a very real, physical, visceral way, I owe God my existence and my life, you're also removing it from man's use. You're removing it from my ability to use it. And very often, part of sacrifice can be a sacred meal. It's part of what we go to God, which we burn on the altar as God's part. Part of it could be eaten and consumed by the giving. There's a communion. How is it totally given to God if we eat somebody? So, this shows the communion between God and man. Mm -hmm. uh, so, there are different kinds of sacrifices. Mm -hmm. uh, so some were hol the Holocaust sacrifices, were entirely burnt off. Other sacrifices, there was a share. Uh, to, to show the union between God and man, to that to the sacrifice, the giver took a portion, the priest took a portion, and the rest was given to God. Uh, but the, the Holocaust sacrifices was entirely consumed by, by fire given to God. Uh, to be a priest, Requires three things. It requires someone chosen among other people. You don't belong to the people if there's somewhere that's different, you can't represent. You have to be among their own. Every one of them. The priest's job is to offer the sacrifice to God and have the people. There's no priest for the sacrifice, 
through sacrifice of Christ. So it's, it's someone chosen to offer sacrifice for the people. And has to be approved by God. If the priest is approved by God, somebody doing good, the one that offers sacrifice. The priest is someone who God wants. And him offer sacrifice for your half and can be a much good. It's going to make it worse. So you want someone approved by God, works for the people, and who offers sacrifice. Part of Christ becoming man is to become a priest. Before he, before he became man, he could not be a priest. And he didn't want to. He had to come down. What he offers then is what is, what is Christ, what is the gift that Christ offers? It's life. It's humanity. It's body and life. It's humanity. So he offers humanity. He does so in a way that no human being can. Because you and I, when we die, that's the end of our free choices. I mean, it's just, once we die, we can't offer ourselves, we just die. But Christ, being true God and true man, even after his human death, still retains his, his ability to act. And so even in his death, he's offering the Father his humanity the way no human being can do. And so what he's doing is offering a physical gift to human nature in a way that no human being can. And the gift he offers is the greatest possible gift to imagine. There's three things that can get out of it. Running out of here. Who offers it, what's, what's being given, and how closely it symbolizes and represents the gift. People will pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for an old sweaty towel by some sports player or for an autograph. If I offer you my old used towel, no one would be very with it. Or if an autograph, no one very impressed with it. So who gives it matters. What's being given matters, right? If I have a million dollars or some sports shirt a million dollars, I'll wait a million dollars. And who cares? It's value in itself. It's how personal or how symbolical or death person also matters. Right? Sometimes it's very silly, tiny things, because they're very personal become very important, very precious. So any one of these things make a gift bound. When Christ comes, he offers the gift to the Father, he offers an important value of gift. Why? Because who gives the gift to the gift? God himself, the divine Son, offers the gift. What does he give? The divine humanity. God himself. A close represent what it, it is here. It is and so, for all of these reasons, the best of all possible gifts. He does the way no human being can do. He does so not simply to replace us, to let us then join in the offering, the baptism, be able to share that in his life, his union with him. We can share the offering ourselves. Also, we tap into the Mass, again, we'll talk about the down in the session. This is the sacrifice. It's important. We keep the reality of the sacrifices in our minds. So we just think that oh, the sacrifice was Christ, the text saying, the Father, Lord, I'm going to grit my teeth, but I'm suffering. That's not really what's going on. It's a lot more important. He's coming as a real priest, offering a real physical thing as an act of adoration and love to show who God is. And to do so to make atonement for man's sin. In a liturgical religious way. That's what a sacrifice is. That's what Christ comes to do. The reason why we call what we do sacrifices is because we get the values we join in our hearts to Christ after the cross. In our hearts and our wills, we, and because of, because of our baptisms, we take our little stub toes or our little 
giving them a bowl of meat or chocolate or whatever, that becomes the night of Christ on the cross, and Christ offers that to the Father. Because we're baptized, we're in the of the body, we have a our own share in Christ's act. That's why we call those the sacrifices. They're not full of the sacrifices, they're not this. And so we talk about a sacrifice. Right? The animals being sacrificed, it was by a priest chosen by God, ordained by God, established by God, representing the, the giver, often the individual family, could be, could be the entire Jewish people, pointing to the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, the sacred of the uh, atonement for man's sins and asking for life. That's where sacrifice was, that's the limitation of man. And Christ, of course, is a perfect break because he's true God and true man. So we're closer to God than we can ever be by ourselves. That's the sacrifice. Talk about the sacrifice of the Mass, it's not because you gave up your time and listened to Father Preach. You may have a sacrifice too, but it's referring to that. It's referring to the fact that it's the offer of Christ's life and act of love and adoration of God. We can have a share. That's where the sacrifice is. Cool? Questions? Okay. Okay. Let's go on then to our place. I would call them as a sacrifice. See what they say. <laughs> Why do you call them only sacrifice of mass? I hope they'll be able to say this. But... <clears throat> be interesting to see what they say. Where's our poem? In the course of time, God worked through his holy prophets to teach his people that by the animal sacrifices of the true way of worship, it's not the true way of sacrifice. In other words, he called them to an interior worship, the heart, worship that obeyed God's will. So God established the sacrifice of the animals. He did so for the limited purpose to repair the way of that Christ of God. He's showing because the cross is both Christ comes to take our place, but also is one of us, not for doing it. So Christ brings it again. The animal sacrifice, first of all, it is showing what sin is, what death is, what sin is caused. Compares to the cross. But also has to be that not as purely exterior. But the course of history God God's very clear. It's not that he has hate sheep, he wants, he wants to sacrifice. It's not that he's hungry, he needs to be fed, and he wants sacrifice. You know, the, the gods of, of, the, of the pagans, the Greeks, the Romans, of, of the Babylonians, they were sacrificed to because they were hungry. They had sacrificed them, they starved. Right? They wanted to sacrifice that, that, that they wanted to be fed. And so, Sometimes people would simply say, well, sacrifice, I, I gave my sheep, you go, but then anything. God's very clear for the prophets, it's not the point. It doesn't mean anything, it's not, it's not giving your heart an act of love, it's not something real, something valuable and precious to you. It's not saying to, to God, I want to give you my life and my heart, who I am. It's not important. It's not going to help you. So there's a purification we get to Christ. Not only represent the heart, but transform the heart to the rest. It's understanding, finally, the idea to take hold of time to stress the biggest ones. Particularly during the Babylon exile, when they put on the sacrifice the temple, which had itself been destroyed. Why couldn't the Jews offer sacrifice anywhere the temple? Thank you. 
Right, yeah. So why can't the offer sacrifice in that one? Or offer sacrifice in in another city? In Nazareth or Beth? Why does that have to be in the temple? Sacred place, but the temple wasn't always there. And there used to be a, you know, they used to offer sacrifice in Shiloh, but that was destroyed. Where the ark was? Where the ark was, and who established that place? God. Right? <laughs> so, so the reason why they put it on the back the God said, offer it here. Offer it in this way. Offer it like this. Because the sacrifices don't come from men. Yes, we're the ones who offer physical things. We're the ones who. But the sacrifice begins in God's search, in God's adventure, in God's help. See, religion, again, is not simply us coming to God and saying, finally, we earned our way to your throne. Finally, we're so good, we got it. I'm not going to think this way. You know, we don't hear, we don't hear. We're thinking, if I'm a sinner, can't come to God. If I'm a bad person, God will hate and reject me. So, God is where it begins. God starts the process. God comes to stab into the sacrifice. And so when we could not offer sacrifice in the temple, they could offer sacrifice in the temple. They did what they could, which was love God, adore God, and, and, and their, their longing and their prayer and their hearts. Say, Lord, we give you the in our will and our hearts and our love, these sacrifices meant. We can't express them externally, we can do it internally. We can't offer you in a physical way, but you ask us to these things. And so in the meantime, going to desire and do our best. We actually have a similar thing here um, for the sacrifice. What would ha happen, for example, if you were dying and you wanted to die on the summer and couldn't see a priest? You go to confession. And you're screwed to nothing bad for you. So what do you do? Confess to God and offer a perfect act of contrition. Which is the desire for confession and say, I love for you, I'm going to say, I'm sorry. I said to because I hate, I hate my sin, but I have love for you. Right, so, a perfect act of contrition is love of God. A perfect act of contrition is because I'm, I, I hate sin because I'm embarrassed. That works, it's, it's enough for the confessional, the sacrament. But outside of the sacrament, if there is an emergency, it's not possible. The desire for these things is sufficient. We don't have baptism of desire. It's baptism of desire. What was that? Sorry, baptism of desire. Right, there's no other way to be baptized for some reason. Like you're by yourself, you're dying alone. No baptism of desire. You can't have a human who is already baptized, you can sit by a car and die. You know, their intent is to get baptized, their desire is to get baptized. I was going to say, whoops, well, I missed my five minutes, it's bad for you. <laughs> the Lord sees the heart of desire and the love. And so in this way, when they lost the temple, the Jewish people had to exercise in their hearts a desire and an intention to offer sacrifice. So they offer the interior part as most important. The bishop doesn't give some examples. Later, for example, the prayer of Azariah, which expresses the idea that the true sacrifice of God would come from the suffering of the people themselves. And their prayer to God made sure sacrifice. At this time, there is no prince, no prophet, or leader. No burnt offering, or sacrifice, or relation, or incense. Different kinds of offering, different temples, worship God in the temple. No place to make an offering before you by mercy. Because in the temple where you found, you know, the temple where you, the kingdom of God, the temple where you united. You would call to try our humble spirit, and maybe he said, So a word with the burnt offerings of rams and bulls, the tens of thousands of fat lambs. Thus may our sacrifice be in your sight this day. May we wholly follow you, but with no shame to those who trust you. He's recognizing God's goodness to know. There's an important principle of theology that people forget sometimes. Very important. Necessary to remember. The important principle of theology is this. Very important. <laughs> I think we forget sometimes. You know, we be, 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 we be
And, and so Azariah knows that God is going to accept the heart and the love and the desire. The sorrow of the heart asks for forgiveness. That when they're doing the best we can, God will step in. So question for you then. If that's okay, if that's a way I can simply say, I'm giving my heart and my soul, and God will step in, why can't they say that they're all in heaven? Why can't the, why can't the Jewish people say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to go offer sacrifice for myself in the forest. God's everywhere. I'm going to go pray in the forest, and I'll sacrifice in the forest. But I'm going to bother the temple. You know, that high priest, he's, you know, he, I don't know, he doesn't to talk very well, and, you know, I'm going to do it myself in my heart. You don't want a lamb. Why can't they do that? If, if, it's, if this is what the Lord wants, why can't they do that? But it's okay here. So why is it okay afterwards? Obedience. And because it assumes something, right? This is acceptable because the best we can is the top. It's not yet perfect. It's, it's not human. Right? It's human beings express. The human map. This is the situation that the Jews are currently stuck in. Right. They don't have to right. But there is no sacrifice. So they're, they're called to offer this sacrifice. Join in this sacrifice. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but yes, I mean, so the reason why is because you don't take the situation of emergency as the idea. And so in emergency, yes, if, if, if we were to use God, we forbid, in a place where we're the last, tomorrow comes legal to be Catholic, and you're all you know, hidden in the way, can't go to Mass. We're not going to say, well, you're going to go to sin, you're going to Mass on Sunday. But it doesn't mean that, then, then that afterwards it becomes legal again, you can't go to Mass, you're not going to have to go to Mass anymore because I, I missed the Mass. What you do is you offer God the best you can. And if at the time it's not the ideal, it's the best you can, who accepts it? If they don't need to do more, you more. And so people who try to uh, assume in their hearts, but because God will accept the best you can when it's, when it's little, the widow's might. And therefore, when the wealth is okay to keep giving much, the wealthy can't get away with giving the widow's might. They're expected to give more to the head. The widow will give them those much, she's giving more. She's giving everything. The wealthy, if you're giving them their pennies, are not doing God's will. The same thing is true of the sacrifice. In time of emergency, we go off for our hearts, we go off for our lives, we go off for our will, do the best we can. We the sacraments, we go to profession, we improve that's contrition, and then send them to sorrow. Turn toward mercy and trust. We can go to confession, go to confession. We can give God great things, give God great things. We can't, the Lord steps in. So the Lord will step in and take care of us, do the best we can. If not do the best we can, or we'll give, we'll give a daughter, then we're in trouble. Make sense? 22. Well, I'm quick today, so I'm told you. I'm going to tell you two around. Two around and that out. It's great. One difficulty still remains. Since human hearts are not pure and much, the sacrifice given to God will not be whole and complete, not be perfect. Right, so, so even if the best we can, even the most perfect act of humility and act of love and adoration, Our best is good enough because of what we love, because of ritual sin, because we're sinners, because we're weak and perfect. So even when we're as sorry as we can be, there's still more we could be. Even though as much as we can, there's still more we should be. And so, even though the Old Testament was being deceived in the importance of God's work sacrifice, the people that could not accomplish such a thing. God himself had to write the answer. In the story of Abraham and Isaac, when Isaac never was about to offer the best he can to his son, it's the best he had to offer. He loves Isaac more than himself. 
And God stops him and says, don't offer that. Who supplies the next sacrifice? God. God. God himself supplies the sacrifice. When we can offer the sacrifice, who supplies the sacrifice? God. He sends to the Lamb, his son, perfect sacrifice, who is pure, who is holy, who is heaven. This is where the sacrifice of Jesus enters in. You see, it's been already in the current, the bread of life discourse talking about earlier. You just spoke about the bread that I should give. If the bread of life himself was referring to his passion and death, he would give himself up for our salvation. And around the Last Supper, Jesus fulfilled this promise and took bread and wine and said, This is my body. But a cup. Right at these words of both the sacrifice of the Old Testament, there is something new here. These words you said, even for you, God, for the new man. There is reference in these words to suffering certain souls, which help us to understand the more deeply and signify the end of sacrifice. We must forgive sins and bring hearts to God. Sacrifice was offered for many different reasons. One of them was a cover. What is a cover? Contract. Contract? Okay. Um, Promise and agreement. An agreement? A mutual self given. A mutual self given. Yeah, all those. Are good. Um, covenants would take place in the Old Testament times between peoples and then families and between nations. Do you know what happened when the covenant was made? The covenant looked like externally. They killed animals. Killed animals? Split them. Why? The animal volcano. The animal volcano was all done. Parties. That's why you're splitting the You're joining the two parties. You're, you're right. But what you're saying is in the sight. Now we're so close to that we're supposed to be one that has separated us except by separating this animal. What happens to this animal if we separate what happened once? We're one. Right? And so, so if the animal dies when it separates, we will die. We tore it apart. We broke it. That's a close view. God enters into a covenant with his people. And he does so in a human manner that ever understood the time. Through the death of a bull, the sprinkling of other bull's blood. The covenant took place in the death of all. Sacrifice of all. And the time of Moses. So God is saying to his people, you are so close to me, you are one. And that would be split or second. So when Christ comes and offers up the mass, I said, this is about my a new covenant. What does he say? He's saying, I am first offering a sacrifice. I am the new sacrifice. He's saying we're united together, not simply by the sake of this symbolic setting the blood of the bull, but by the blood of God. God sheds his blood, unite man and God together. God and his blood joins together and walk. Because we're so close then that that baptism, we receive this blood of Christ the first time, and that's us the first time, baptism. It's so true and so close to you that you're marked forever. Even in hell, you've been marked as God's child. That seal, that mark, never goes away. You're forever marked and long ago. It happens to blood of the Son of God. The cross is a I'll wait for that a little bit. We'll get to the covenant. So I'll wait. I'll 
from his faith. Um, but there were other reasons to offer sacrifice. To offer sacrifice for four basic reasons. I mean, uh, different ways to do it, but four basic reasons. The same reason you offer prayer. Yes. So there are sacrifices that are, first of all, adoration, sacrifices for forgiveness of sins, sacrifices of thanksgiving, and sacrifices asking God to apply for our needs. These are also, by the way, the reason we offer Mass today. These are the four means we offer Mass, the reason we sacrifice, the reason we pray. Remember we talked about a few two weeks ago where the Jewish people blood is blood. Right? And so blood belongs to God. And so by this sacrifice, by this covenant, Christ is sharing with us his own life, his own blood, his own divine. And he has shown us not by sprinkling over our heads, which happened in the old covenant, the head of baptism, the blood of the bull, but by consuming, but by receiving into our bodies, our inmost being. Because anointed is the center of the exterior head. The interior soul. What we're seeing slide isn't merely the body, the heart, the soul of man, heart, soul of sacrifice resides. This is how it's the sacrifice, the law. With these few words, Jesus fulfills what he promised in the sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel. By giving us this flesh for the appearance of bread, he also anticipates the passion of death and our go the next day. More than this, he shows that his death is meant to be a And the Eucharist is very body and blood, being not and poured out is that sacrifice. Help to understand why man decided to do this in of me. He would always enter into that sacrifice once and for all. This is why we say the memorial of the Eucharist Master represents, represents, and produces to us. That would have laid away upon the altar. If you were to be a news reporter recording Sacrifice of cross on Calvary. What do you look at sacrifice? Would you see in there a priest offering up a physical gift and a raising to God to forgive sins of people? Would you look, would you look, would you look at that here? Probably not. Right? What you would see is it's pagans beating up a, 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 a man. Rejected by his people, who dies in a bloody way. Doesn't look like a religious act of adoration. <clears throat> we know what it is. We understand it. We think of that. But if you were, we know that because of what the apostles say, because of what, what we're told. How do we know that Christ meant it as a sacrifice, it's not simply as you know, you got caught, you got trapped, and you died. What was that? Faith. Faith and also the Christ helps. Where is Christ helps? The Last Supper supplies a context. The Last Supper shows us what's going on on the surface. Without the Last Supper, if these Christ just died at the Last Supper, we have no way of knowing what he was doing. The Last Supper proves to us what's really going on. In the Last Supper, the Lord takes and says, I'm doing this in my own free will. 
I'm doing this as act of religion. I'm doing this as a covenant. I'm doing this for our people. I'm doing this to save you. I'm doing this to claim it own and to walk for forgiveness of sins and the of my fault. The Last Supper is a context and a meaning and shows what the sacrifice of the cross is. There's this term that is used. It's both as Jewish groups, memorial. They do this memory of me. Where do you hear those words in the Mass? The most right here. The end of the Twelve Days of the Chalice. It's the words of Christ. Unfortunately, just like sacrifice, we've lost what this means. The Jewish people, the memorial is never in me as something very deliberate and very real. The Passover sale was the religious rite signifying and representing and showing and reminding them the Exodus. God took his people, the people on his own, saved them from slavery, and brought them to the promised land. This was a memorial. The memorial is different than simply a celebration. The memorial meal is different than simply celebrating what happened in the past. You have a birthday, you rejoice, you were born, and have a big party, that's not a memorial. Celebrate Columbus Day, you know, with Columbus, that's not a memorial. The memorial is very specific. In the Passover meal, the Sinner meal, one thing that's said, emphasized over and over again, is that when God did these things for our fathers, He did them for me. He said, it says in there, if God had not redeemed our fathers from slavery in Egypt, I would be a slave right now. Memorial was saying, this was done for me. Not just those people on go, those animals, old people far away. This was for me, for mine. To make it present in a symbolic way, in a remembrance, and saying, This is something that happens to me now, for me now. And every part of, the, of that song of remembrance in the Seder of Passover Seder, which is the context of Mass, the Jewish people of the Seder meal uh, would go through where they remember everything that was done, the ten plagues, and all this coming redeemed them, and the golden, and the golden, and the uh, the Passover lamb, the part of the Red Sea. So this happened to me. This was the God did for me personally. The memorial meal takes this past event and makes it present. Now it's, it's, a, it's still some wall. But Christ does is deeper than that because he's done. Human beings don't only do it small. It means only do it and say, okay, make this bad enough. That's the best we can do. God being God and being awesome and powerful, we more. What God does, He makes it truly present. And so now, the sacrifice of the Mass is the reoffering, the renewal of that gift of Calvary. This memory of me is more than just think about what I did for you. It's more than just I was really cool at one time. I did this for you. This is, this is the renewal, this is the reoffering, this is the, the gift being offered again once much more. I like to explain this. So I like to tell an analogy. I say, they say, imagine for your birthday, our Bible, wrap it nicely, put it in the box, rip it in the bowl, nice card, give it the book. You open it up, you say, no, I have three copies already, so I'm going to go put it in a nice little bag and give it to my brother. And looks at it and says, eh, uh, interesting, I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it to some of my friend. His hands are over his friend. How many gifts, how many books were there? One book. How many times was it given? How many people have gifted you books that you already have? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the point of the story. <laughs> it was given in different ways, right? It was given to wrapped up, it was given just a bad, it was handed over, different ways, 
but still, still the same old. Through the sacrament of the Eucharist, God has found a way to make the one sacrifice, the lack of Calvary, be offered, it will be offered again and again and again. Same gift, offered many times. What happens at Mass is a new sacrifice. The sacrament of Calvary offered once again, and we should be able to share it again and again, and offer it again and again. Because if it is perfect and belongs to God, we can offer it again and again, day by day. We go into it again and again, day by day. So when Sacrament Christ makes a memorial meal, he's making this one act sacrifice present to us every time he wants to be. He's making us be able to share into it when I want to be. I mean, speaking with I can offer to God Calvary. You and I can offer God Calvary. If that doesn't blow your mind, if that doesn't astonish you, then you're not getting it. We can offer God the heart of Christ, love of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, death of the cross. We share it. That's happening in Mass. That's happening every time we're in And so when we're at the memorial meal of the Mass, not simply a symbolic remembrance or a nice little little tableau showing what happened long ago. It is the gift made present on the altar once again, off once again, in a different manner. It's not bloody. But the same of Christ that last time. Let me read a couple of the footnotes here, um, quoted in Cabot. The Eucharist is a sacrifice that makes, represents, makes present, the sacrifice of the cross. Because it is, it's memorial, because it applies fruit. So it gives to us what Christ wants for us on the cross. It distributes it, it hands it out. Can't be kept. In the sense of sacred scripture, the memorial is not merely the recollection of past events. The proclamation of the mighty works by God for men. The church of celebration of these events they become for a certain way present and brief. See also the Sacred Council, such as the Chilean Wars, verse 47. In the last supper, right when he was betrayed, I was instituted the Eucharist sacrifice of his body and blood. This order perpetuated the sacrifice of the prophet of the centuries. This should come again. Those who entrust with love and spouse the church are more than his death and resurrection, a sacrament of love, a sign of unity, and bond of charity. Christ says to the church, Do this. What is Christ doing at the last supper? Bread and wine to his followers. It's even bread and wine? It's himself. It's himself. It's only bread and wine. And so he's taking that bread and wine, making it first of all the law. Himself. And this is, as he shows, the sacrifice of his body and blood. This is the sacrifice. Same sacrifice, the cross. So Christ says, Do this, he's saying, Do what I do. In other words, I'm giving you the power and the authority to do what I just did. Do what I'm doing. To take ordinary bread and wine. To transform it into my body and blood, which is the sacrifice of the Lord. Make present then the sacrifice done that, that, that I have done and can do. Will do more. Remember that God, God is out of time. God is out of time. Um, Hobbes requires this analogy of the circle. I know. <laughs> Hands a <are> circle. <laughs> he says, if you look at the drawing about points on this in the circumference, and measure around the circumference, it's going to be different distances from each other. 
commute here is, is a, the short distance from here to here. That was not. He says, that's how we human beings view time. He says, if you look at these, in that center of time, and in the circle, all of the points are equal, the center. From God's point of view, nothing is before or after. Nothing is farther away, closer. All the turn of the present down. Now remember, Jesus Christ is true God and true man. So he is both living in time and also in eternity. And what that means is his divine acts, his divine power, his divine life. Be applied to us. It's, it's human acts and then be given to us through his divine life. Right? So, so for us, we are 2,000 years away from the sacrifice. For God, that night and today are the same as tomorrow. They're present, no, right now. And so for God, it takes to to take any effort in him to make them link together, link together. So Christ, being true God and true man, becomes a bridge between time and eternity. We can apply to us what he did for us without years ago because he's truly God. And through the Mass, the liturgies, the sacraments, we have real contact and union with what Christ did without years ago. Isn't that mind blowing? Literally, we can be at the feet of Calvary. Yeah. Exactly. Literally, we, 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 the mass, is, we can literally be in, in, in the, the crib of that. We can receive a drop of Christ's heart, of Christ's love, of his father and love, that at the last song. At any moment of his life, we connect with those. The reason why we have a difference in the race of the church that we hear, remember his circumcision, his invitation temple, his sacrifice, all different events, so we draw from them literally. We literally say the feet of Christ and receiving from them the grace he won by those things. Absolutely. You know, this is this is what our liturgy is, which is what we're doing. Not just I thought about it once and it was cool. Not just a memorial. This is God in prison to us is divine is what Christ did. What that means is that you're not fully separated from us. United us. Because he is truly God and truly man. God is so awesome. <laughs> what God has done for us in heaven. Article 23. The Eucharist is therefore a sacrifice. It's the sacrifice. What do you think? the The Eucharist is therefore a sacrifice. In truth, because of the resurrection of our Lord, the Eucharist is a living sacrifice. The Lamb of God was slain for the sins of the world. It is this Lamb of God returned to the Father to worship and adore the Mass? One of the difficult things in comprehending the Mass, comprehending the sacrifice of the cross, is because it both is Calvary and the risen living cross. Time and wine and water. Um, so Christ right now is in heaven, right? Christ is now in heaven. What is Christ doing in heaven right now? Then the time of the Father, and he is loving the Father, adoring the Father, as St. Paul said. Presenting to the Father his wounds. He's the intercessor. He's showing the Father the wounds of love. So, this is what I did for, my, for, for these people, for our people, my, your children, my children. 
In other words, what he's doing there, adoring God and offering up to the Father on our behalf, is love. Jesus Christ now is loving, adoring, and involved in his human nature. He's also God. As a man, he is a creature. As a man, he's created. Not in the divine nature. That lose you in that? Do you follow this part? Okay. So it's, he's two parts. He's in his human nature. He is created. But not in his divine nature. But because he's, he's a, he's a, he, he is a created part of him, he can worship the Father and offer the Father perfect adoration of God. Because when we receive the Eucharist, we have a connection then not only to Calvary, but also to heaven. Eucharist pulls from heaven, because that's what Christ is. We're, we're, we're tied only back to Calvary, but also another point where, where Christ is in heaven. Christ is adoring the Father of heaven, and therefore this is the seat of glory for the dust of heaven preparing us for eternal life. Where we will join Christ, not our Father, being at the right hand of God as well. This is why Christ tells us, you know, in the Bread of Life Discourse, my flesh is, it is through food and others through drink. We expect that the drinks about the eternal life. Because what does he have in eternal life? We receive from the Eucharist, we're, we're, we're receiving living Christ, the resurrected Christ, in heaven and the fall. This is a sacrifice of Calvary, we receive the resurrected Christ. It's love. If you go home with your head straight, don't blame it. I need to review this. Thank you. This is, this is, this is, this is incredible. Again, people get, have said this before, but I mean, if someone's bored of mass, they don't understand what to do. If someone that's bored of mass, they think it, it's us receiving things from God, that's all it is. Don't hear me. No. It's not about that. About us being able to love God, worship God, unite to God, walk with God. This, this is beyond God. This is what we're doing in our hearts and our lives. This is what we for God as a people, as a culture. This is what we've lost. I want to go back to this, to remember this, make a part of who we are. But this is why people would make Sundays be a day that's separate from the rest of the week. This is why they'd make Sundays be a day that they would travel, where they would do things that make Mass special. This is why they're going to churches. Because living in that church, our little double wide trailer of church, that's what we can give God right now. It's pretty nice right now. <laughs> But living in that church, where you're away from us, is the eternal life of living God. We get to receive the risen Christ. We get to adore, we offer the Father, the sign of Calvary. We say the thing of Calvary and, and, and be part of this great sign of love and adoration. That's the news. If you forget that, I think this has a nice building, nice pictures, while they come and talk to us and give a nice message, is love each other, or miss the point. We're sitting at Christ, at God's feet, walking with Christ, living with Christ, being with Christ. This new covenant, which is his sacrifice of all power. We have to remember these things, we can make them part of our hearts. So we can then join in as Azariah and, and the, the three men of the first did, and offer the best of their lives and their hearts to fall. It simply remains Christ's sacrifice. It simply remains something that Christ does and we ignore it. Not going to do us much good. Not going to help us much. I come to Mass, I mean, think of who was at the foot of Calvary. The soldiers were there, the pagans were there, the high priest was there, who rejected Christ. The bad thief was there, who rejected Christ. They were all present at Calvary. They didn't do them much good. Mary was present at Calvary, they were not a good. Major Macklin can see the major was saying. Mary Macklin's there at Calvary. Transformed her, let her love be a great saint. So just because we're present in the church, we have to ask ourselves, am I sharing in my heart though? Am I simply observing the sidelines like the pagans, like those who were yet us? At the, the sheriff. So the sacrifice is both precarious, he's on work, he died. 
but also filling our vocation as human beings to work with God, to join with God. God fills it, we couldn't do. We do our best. The Lord pours into our hands infinite treasure that's here, give this to my fault. It becomes your gift too. We get off God. Prayer for the eternal life. Infinite life. That's tact in that room. It's beautiful. Okay, this five o'clock. We got through the, through the uh, section. We can stop there, or we can start on our daily bread in the next few verses. Entirely up, up to you. Uh, I am happy I will. We shall do the like Please. <laughs> I watched um, Father Matt, you know, the president, and he. Never uh, recorded. Synod, uh, synod, uh, synod, uh, synod, uh, the synod of sin. The synod of sin. Synod of sin. Synod Anyway, apparently, we'll be both or to be with the folks. And she, uh, she just adores everything he's doing and just rolling, rolling with something. They have one church, just one church, and no matter, and she listed her sins and she currently went to Catholic school. And she's just so happy that he's trying to change all of this stuff. And, um, let's see what to say. And, and you have these other people. Agreeing with her, they have no idea what you have just shared with us. No, no. And I mean, she concluded about that. She just, you know, it's just, it was sickening. And it was, you know, it's being promoted by the victor of the church. That's not right. It's so much has been lost. Let me say two things. Um, so, first of all, I have to less than the lost. Less than the lost. Um, let, let me see. At this point, nothing comes out of the salvation. And because of that, it is possible, possible, that the intention of our Holy Father is simply that people speak their minds and people can address it better. It's possible. That was the hope. You know, where he river, he can let people understand, see where people are at, and then walk with them and talk. That, that would be a great thing. Um, but if it's not happening, that's a lot of things that we But it's absolutely, we're not inventing something. If you invent something new, it's just our Christ talk, period. If you're inventing a new way to worship, a new way to preach, a new, a new teaching, look at Galatians, right? It, it, uh, either we are into heaven where the teaching of God is different than what Christ gave, let them be cursed. Let them be damned, literally. You don't think they deserve that. You're fine. Right. Unity from below means nothing. The dead are all united. They're all dead. The unity from below is a unity is is from nothing. Unity from above is life and resurrection and truth. And so, yes, uh, our job is not to invent something new, or invent a new way of doing things, or to fix things a new way, because they're not so smart to do it. Our job is to be faithful. Our job is to fast the truth. Our job is to learn what Christ said and live that belief. Because life doesn't come from us, it comes from Christ. Our hearts are not enough to love God and earth. We can't. And if you don't know that at this point, then look hard at your heart. There was a time when I did think I could love my death on my own. Did think my heart was good enough. Did think I want that bad. I love that. <laughs> yeah, I need those actions. You got to say. I need, but the fact is, we have them. Don't have to discover them, have to, they don't have to try to find them. We already have them. Now we just have to remember it and live it and hold that in faith. All we have to do now is to say, this is what's given to us. This is the treasure we received from our fathers. This is what they died for. I'm going to do the same thing that I received that in my heart, my life, and live this out, period. 
This is Christ by the Christ's goodness and Christ's gift to us. We now cross our heavenly fall. We don't have to though. We don't have to give them new answers. They have all the answers. They have all the truth. Now we just have to remember and live it out. So the answer to any new problem is going to be the answer to our gift. Which is Christ. And so, so maybe it's a new problem or, or a new tyrant or a new fear or a new. Fine. The answer is still the same. The solution is still the same. The life is still the same. You don't have to worry about maybe the God's not going to supply the answer this time. So he said, there's something. He said, life is said, life for us to get to the eternal life. You're not afraid. We have God Himself on our side. Who cares who's against us? We'll look for even how the right numbers on the answer because God is at my side. If God is for us, if God died for us, if God has given us his life, why did we why did we be afraid? Right, well, like St. Peter on the boat, where the winds, you know, where the storms there, the waves are there. We know in our heads who this is. With water in the water, we're going to look at I said, I said, we, I'm not saying, you know, saying we. Lose myself. <laughs> We need to remember my again and again of who's truly there. And we'll fast to that faith, we'll live it out, and let Christ pick us up when we falter and sin because we're scared. You see the waves. God's with us. It doesn't matter if it's wrong. It doesn't matter if that's right. It doesn't matter if that the died on the cross. Right? For, the, for the apostle, Christ died on the cross, that was everything. It was, it was the end of things. We know that was the beginning of things. That was that was life. Paul Peter, that, who is, what are we talking about? It's over. It's the end. You fail. We fail. Let him fail. This was victory. <laughs> what was that? They go for the Holy Spirit. They they go for the Lord. Yeah. yeah I mean, Absolutely. Yes. That the Holy Spirit came yeah. and gave gave them the bravery, the gifts they needed to go out and do their job. Absolutely. Uh, nothing safe for us. Yeah. So. This is just so awesome. What the Lord does to us. And, and this is something that, again, you can learn in, in five minutes. Spend the rest of your life picking it apart, understanding it, and making it your own. It's all these hermits. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's never going to take yes. a lifetime for you to. Understand, I mean, yeah, yeah it starts to break it down, and, and we never will. Never will. <laughs> it's just, and, and even a five year old child can understand it perfectly. Right. That's Jesus, that's God, I believe. That's sacrifice the cross, right? Mm -hmm. And you see the, the faith of the children who, who believe it and walk with it and mean it, and it's incredible. Uh, St. Bonaventure was a brilliant scholar of this day. The question of his brothers, and his brother's mother says, Bonaventure, you're so wise and brilliant and incredible. I wish I had your wisdom. Monarch said, You know, the important thing is the love. You no. Know, like some of the old ladies in church and the way they love God, and they're gonna be much greater than Bonaventure. And the brother really excited, he said, Wait a minute, you're saying that these people don't want to study this much, and this is gonna be greater than that. Yeah, absolutely. You're running out to everyone, everyone around and said, listen to me, I think the great news, this incredible news, even the little ladies who did great in front of all of them, should love God. <laughs> you know, it's hit in a new way. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> even you and I can be yes, speaking greater than Bonaventure or Bonaventure, if you love God. We're going to pause then for the day and can pick up next week. Let's close with a prayer and then take that part. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, you accepted the sacrifice of Son. You sent your Son to be our sacrifice of our grace. And you went up our hearts individually as a parish, as a parish family. The great meaning of this Eucharist, what Christ has done for us, the sacrifice is offered. Help us enter into the sacrifice more deeply, day by day, every Sunday. We may unite with Christ and wish us to, and receive Him the fruits and the life He wants to give us. 
and all that we say and do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.